Good morning, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started um, since I know there are people watching on the live stream. And I want to be mindful of everyone's time and also, of course, the people in the building. Um, good morning. Uh, a few uh, informational points before we begin. The first is that Rupika Rassam very kindly posted her comments yesterday with hyperlinks. So despite the technical difficulties of the Skype call, um, we can have that be part of our conversation and the ways that we sort of think about this discussion uh, moving forward. Um, and if you're a presenter and you didn't get your bag, make sure to talk to me because I want to make sure that everyone gets a bag. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Marsha Shadlin of Georgetown University. Uh, the hashtag syllabus has become an extremely important genre in digital humanities work. Although its importance may be less visible to discourses of what we have been calling capital DH work. As the creator of the Ferguson syllabus, Marsha Shadlin asks important questions also about labor, service, and social media in her recent publications on digital humanities work. And uh, as the editor, a uh, co-editor with Jacqueline Wernemont, the fantastic Jacqueline Wernemont, I should say, of the uh, volume in the Debates in Digital Humanities series on feminist digital humanities, uh, uh, Professor Shadlin's essay is, uh, will definitely, I think, be one of the, the ones that are, is taught and cited in that volume. Dr. Shadlin is an associate professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University the author of Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration from Duke University Press in 2015. She is a public voice on the history of African American children, race in America, as well as social movements. In 2014, she organized her fellow scholars in a social media response to the crisis in Ferguson, Missouri, entitled Hashtag Ferguson Syllabus. Ferguson Syllabus has led to similar initiatives online and has shaped curricular projects in K through 12 settings, as well as academia. She hosts Office Hours, a podcast in which she talks to millennials about what is most important to them. In 2016, Shadlin was named a top influencer in higher education by the Chronicle of Higher Education. She has also been the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, DC, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. So I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Shadlin. Thank you. Hi, folks. Good morning. Thank you for getting up so early to come to this conversation. I have half an hour, and so I really want to just say, talk for maybe 10 to 11 minutes, and then really open up a conversation about our position as scholars and our sense of what we say is responsibilities. Um, I think for me, there are kind of two key turning points in my career. And if there are any graduate students in the room, this message really is for you. You actually do finish graduate school. <laughs> I, 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 and and, I, and I, say, I bring this message of hope to you because um, <laughs> for me, um, I, had a, I had a year on a, a Ford um, Diversity Fellowship postdoc, and I was, I was here at the College of William & Mary with my husband who was on another fellowship, and that year I lost a book contract, um, had to go through my third year review, and I was thinking to myself, if I just quit right now, if I just quit academia right now, no one will know about these failures. And so coming back here um, as an invited speaker, someone who actually has their book done and working on another book, um, I just want to remind all of us that we move on to the next thing. And I think that communities like this is what makes that possible. So that's my testimony this morning. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so with that, I, I want to think about my experiences with the Ferguson syllabus um, in, in terms of a deep debt and gratitude to a legacy that shapes this institution, the institution I work at, and institutions across the country, and that is the ways in which African-American labor has been cut off from um, 
the possibilities in higher education. And the reason why I connect Ferguson to my institution of Georgetown University, which has been part of a two-year reflective process about thinking of its slaveholding past, is because the reason I was interested in Ferguson as a scholar and as a citizen was because I attended the University of Missouri as an out-of-state student on a scholarship. And one of the things that I learned very quickly when I attended the University of Missouri was that a critical mass of people of color in the state were paying taxes into a university system that their children would never attend. And I felt, especially as an out-of-state student, a particular debt and a sense of gratitude to the citizens of that state for providing me with an education. And so after I graduated the University of Missouri, I stayed engaged with not only the institution, but the state. And so in 2014, when I was you know, watching the news and I saw images like this in a town like Ferguson, um, in a place that is not a Newark or a Chicago or a Detroit where we associate this type of spectacle with, but these Midwestern, somewhere between exurbs, somewhere between small town, it really struck at the heart of my own educational journey and my successes in academia and I felt like I had to do something. And as I was preparing for the academic school year and the images from Ferguson um, were being uh, broadcast nationally and internationally, I thought to myself, how is this going to fundamentally change the way my first year students at Georgetown are gonna think about their college education? I don't know about you, but when you're a kid, you have nothing going on. And so your life begins in September and you start to reimagine the possibilities of your life in August when school starts again. And I think about that a lot with my students. And so when I was thinking about how I was going to talk about Ferguson in the classroom, my only reference point was Los Angeles in 1992. And I was talking to a friend and he said, you realize these kids weren't even born yet. <laughs> when, you know, this, for them, this is something they may have heard about. But the reference point is, is fundamentally different. And so I knew I had to find a vocabulary in which to talk to students about a present day crisis that has long and deep roots and requires both their attention intellectually and emotionally. The other thing I was really concerned about was the way that the conversation about Ferguson, about police brutality, about the materials that were being used against protesters, about who was at fault, this kind of thing that we've seen today, this idea that there are two sides, right, and they're both equally and morally um, valid and we have to kind of engage with that. I felt like what was being also lost was the fact that this was a story about grief. It was a story about black grief that was being reproduced and available um, to so many audiences without any regard to the intimacy of a grieving process of a community and that it was being fundamentally ignored in the conversations that arose. And so these were the two things that I was thinking about as I was entering the school year. And the last thing I think I was also shaped by was earlier that summer, Stanley Nelson's documentary about Freedom Summer had come out about 1964, um, the Mississippi Project in 1964, and I thought it would be wonderful if a thousand educators would commit to showing the Freedom Summer documentary that year to commemorate the fact that SNCC wanted 1,000 volunteers to go into the state of Mississippi. And so I tried to get people very excited about this on Twitter and it did not work. No one really cared. So that was my first attempt at trying to dedicate a school year to a common purpose and that went nowhere. And so with all of these elements in mind, I thought about Ferguson syllabus as a way to do three distinct things. One, demonstrate to our students that the silences that we have out there don't have to be replicated in our institutions, in our classrooms. To think about the idea of the dedication of a school year to a single idea or a single principle or a set of problems, and that in that dedication process, we teach students how to resist the idea of forgetting and moving on. And I think the third goal with Ferguson's syllabus 
was to be very intentional about forming a community around the exhaustive work of being the only class or the only um, faculty member who will bring it up that day. So if the first day of school in Ferguson, Missouri was not possible because of this breakdown in the structure of Ferguson, Missouri, what could we do in terms of dedicating that first day of class? Before the character assassination of Michael Brown started in the press, he was described as a young man on his way to school. He was going to college in the fall. He was going to start this vocational training program. There was attention to the fact that he beat significant odds in order to graduate from a school in the Ferguson Fluorescent School District. And then that narrative disappeared. And so I said, if we dedicate our first day of school to the empty seat that Michael Brown will not occupy and to the children of Ferguson who will not have a normal school year, what does that do to resist the new narratives about Michael Brown and what happened in Ferguson? Um, the other thing that I discovered in this process was that I had enjoyed Professor Twitter for years before that. I enjoyed black Twitter immensely. I feel like some of the best um, comedy writing, the best humor writing happens on black Twitter. Um, but I also discovered that black professor Twitter was particularly um, both, both humorous and also very present. And that um, my scholars of color on Twitter, it seemed like we were all meeting at the same point, talking about the same things at the same time. Very loosely, but I think that our concern about how our institutions would be responding or not responding to Ferguson also, feel, also felt like it was part of the conversation. And so the ask was simple. What can you do in your classroom on the first day of school to remember that Ferguson is a crisis in which the intellectual work we do on our campuses can be responded to through that framework? that everyone has a hot take on cable news, but what we have in the academy is the capacity for some deep thinking and some reflection. And so here are some of the outcomes of that experience, and then I really do want to open it up for a little bit of a conversation. Um, what Ferguson's syllabus did was it also made me aware of the way that media sources material, and this is something I did not understand because I wasn't very active on Twitter. The number of radio and news producers who use a Twitter feed as a tool of evaluation to invite people onto their programs is both, um, in a sense, democratizing, but also incredibly uh, disconcerting. That, um, a little, that, a, that a Twitter imprint then provides a fast track to a kind of platform to express ideas, and it can go in a number of directions. But I was grateful to the people who reached out to me through Twitter to ask me to give their insights. And it gave me an opportunity, and the only reason I have all these pictures of myself is it's illustrative, um, <laughs> is that it gave me an opportunity to teach as a scholar of color in public for good and for bad. So the good part of that was an opportunity, I think, to demonstrate what people trained in the humanities do, what we provide, what kind of insight and framework and context that is missing from the conversation. But what it also does, it, um, oh, it opens kind of me as an individual and us as a community to the kind of vitriol we know is always waiting for us um, through this type of public engagement. But one of the things that I was particularly happy that I had the opportunity to do was to appear on the PBS NewsHour with a ninth grade teacher. And this goes into one of, I think, the most valuable um, outcomes of Ferguson's syllabus. Um, it helped bridge that K through 12 divide in higher ed because after Ferguson's syllabus was shared among a number of member, uh, a number of faculty members, K through 12 teachers were reaching out to me and saying, listen, my principal said we're not allowed to talk about this. I'm gonna get in trouble. Is there something I can introduce? Is there something small I can do in order to have this conversation in this space? And it made me incredibly reflective about a practice that I probably devolved into in which I was upset that my students weren't ready to come to college, but I didn't know what I was doing to actually get them ready by working in the K through 12 space. And so breaking down that barrier um, provided some insights into how to really thoughtfully support K through 12 teachers. Um, the second thing 
is that um, what's, what all of the material that people shared with each other through Ferguson's syllabus did, it modeled interdisciplinarity in ways that um, were active and I think also very clear about the many dimensions that lead to the type of state violence that we saw in Ferguson. That if this was just about race issues, right, what we call race issues, then the sociologist could solve all those problems. And if this was just um, a financial issue, then our economist friends could solve this problem. But when scholars from across disciplinary boundaries engage this question, we started to think about what does it mean to use tear gas um, in a city like Ferguson when the international community has come out so strongly against tear gas. Um, uh, someone from the Math and Humanities Institute at the University of Maryland sent me some data analytics, you probably can't see it very well, about how the hashtag was trending and when people felt like it was a really important resource. And what I saw from the graph was that people were looking at the hashtag a lot in August and then there was this uptick on December 1st. And that was the day that the St. Louis grand jury decided not to indict Derrick Wilson. And so here we had some evidence about the ways that these materials were being reintroduced or reconstructed considered through the long arc of this story. Um, and the last two things I'll say, it was really helpful in opening up um, a conversation about rethinking public spaces. One of the projects I had an opportunity to consult on, or not really consult, give my thoughts, um, was about what public spaces can be in use when things like Ferguson happen. And so the St. Louis um, Arc, um, different National Park Service sites, National Historic Sites remaining open when school is closed, as well as public libraries was an opportunity, again, to demonstrate that there's a body of literature that people are going to turn to to use as a place to have a conversation, and we need public spaces in which those conversations can happen when our schools and our universities are closed. And finally, um, I think what the syllabus movement has been able to do is creating a mechanism to respond. So that syllabus is a shorthand to, um, to signal that as academics, as scholars, we are watching. We are not allowing these moments to pass and that we have tools to bring to bear that I think are increasingly um, denigrated and belittled. When the terrorist attack in Charlottesville happened, um, someone asked me on a radio show, you know, what should we do if we really care about this issue? And I said, how about you support the humanities? If you think that Confederate memo memorials are not places to learn history, why don't you support pl places that actually do history? And leave me alone. Um, because I think that there's this idea that we can, um, we can just do this work. We can just do it, right? We just know history and we just have archives and we just have the capacity. But if we are concerned about a narrative that again is growing steam under this administration, then we support the institutions that actually do things that are based on facts. And so I think that um, my last, again, I will return to the graduate students in the audience. Um, I did a lot of this stuff before I got tenure. And I think that's really important to say because this could have gone in a number of directions. Fortunately, I was working in an institution that supported and really appreciated this kind of work and really felt like it should be, at, um, should be included in my tenure materials and it was all great. And I've worked at institutions where none of this would fly. But at the end of the day, um, this, this thing that people tell you that after tenure you'll become like a fully formed citizen and you'll be engaged and you'll get woke, that's not true. You have to decide what you're organizing your life around and proceed like that. And so if you organize um, your life around racial justice, economic justice, not forgetting, you just do that in a number of places. Academia doesn't doesn't inspire it, nor should it dictate whether or not you engage. And so with that, I just want to open up for a few more minutes for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Comments, questions? There's a microphone available, perfect.
Or I can just keep talking. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm sure and I hope you hear a lot of thank yous, but I'm going to add more thank you. Oh. Um, like, really. Um, I wanted to backtrack a bit to one of the um, things you sort of brought up and something I'm really interested in I feel like we don't talk about enough. And I shouldn't say not talk about enough. I'm speaking from the perspective of being a faculty person. Um, but we have very busy lives. But thank you so much for talking about it. I, I, I worry about saying, oh, we're not doing this enough. It's like, mm, everyone's working really hard, right? But the question of K through 12, mm -hmm. um, which is a place I've also done work in, the ways in which that system, as you're pointing out, even at the beginning of your talk, when you're talking about sort of realizing there are all these people paying taxes without educational access, um, you're talking about K through 12 there. And so thinking about productive ways to, you know, give back is too weak, but to really mm -hmm. engage. And the thing I like that you said is that in my own work, I've worked more with students. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really glad you point out working with teachers. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? I think it's a weird missing thing. We think of students as these sort of resources and we forget they've right. been in a structure the whole time that needs support, right? Right, so I think on our campuses, you know, we have the tutoring programs. Um, at my institution, there's so many programs that really try to, um, you know, fill some gaps in, in some of the local public schools around literacy and opportunities. But I think that our K through 12 teachers, um, there's, there is, that is such a broad community and everyone is doing, just like our own faculties, right? We're all working hard, but some of us are working harder than others at certain things at any given moment. And so, um, so I used to teach, uh, in Missouri, I used to teach summer high school. So I spent some time with high school teachers and I think that what I could provide the most support with is helping them imagine what's possible within the kind of boundaries of the curriculum. So we have to do a, we have to do a unit on citizenship and this thing is happening and the students want to come talk about it and the principal says no. And I said, okay, if we have all of these constraints, what are the digital materials that I can point you to? Where are some ways that we can think of assignments? So one of the assignments that I've developed for high school teachers is one about um, Little Rock Central High School. I said, that one is a safe one, right? Your school doesn't mind you talking, it's about civil rights, but we're gonna think about it from the perspective of everyone having a choice to make as a citizen in that moment. The choice to you know, resist integration or not. The choice to close the schools or not. And so um, that kind of work with teachers, I've been able to create and then just give away. Um, I know that we have to be very sensitive about making sure our labor is not exploited. And for me, there's certain, there's, there's certain content that if a teacher wants it, they can just have it. Um, I've also tried to spend time working um, with, so, so the federal government for now um, has funding for you know, kind of teacher trainings and professional development. I've done that with schools as well to help teachers kind of confront classroom dynamics, that they may not have the time to go to the 10-week workshop, we can do some very quick things. So I try to be as functional and practical with that community than I might be with kind of peers who have more time. But I, but I do think spending time, and also the NEH programs, for as long as those exist as well, um, for summer uh, high school teachers has been really amazing for me because of Twitter, they're able to share a lot of that information with the teachers who don't get into the programs or who don't have that capacity. And so I think in many ways, if we think about ways that you know the digital humanities can inform our work, the ways that it can, um, instead of just trickling down to K through 12, be really grounded in a awareness of K through 12, I think is a new place that we can really, really make an impact. Yes, Amanda. There's two of y'all. Um, okay, so, you know, a couple weeks ago, we had this workshop at Georgetown about public scholarship and, like, performing. Um, was that so, the one that I was on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I was going to say one of the things that I found um, really frustrating about the way that was organized and that you tried to bring up was the complete lack of acknowledgement of things like harassment and the way that universities and, and public yes. scholars are increasingly... 
under attack. And I was hoping, um, since I didn't get to hear more about it at this workshop, and, and I know this is something that is weighs very heavily on the mind of everyone in the room, if you could talk a little bit about um, your own practices of resilience, how you respond to these things, how much um, Georgetown specifically as an institution or institutions mm -hmm. you know of generally sort of help or hurt mm -hmm. or how they can do better? Um, so I, the, the, the kind of stuff that came out of this period of my life um, was per, per, the, the worst I've ever experienced in terms of the vitriol and the projection and the spinning out perfect strangers, you know, saying anything you can imagine to me. And a lot of it was not only kind of disrespectful to me, but, you know, you know, you think that kids should learn about Mike Brown. I'm glad he's dead. I mean, just this is incredible, um, you know, ability to say and do anything. And the number of people who signed their name, used their real email. Um, there were a couple that said Georgetown class of, you know, insert year here. And so my my old coping strategy was to be creeped out and then delete it and not engage with it. But I, I stopped doing that. And I stopped doing that because, one, it was ex existentially unhealthy. But I always... Um, I always, sh not share, but, um, you know, I'm on Facebook a lot with a lot of thoughts, but I actually share that so my colleagues understand that we're not doing the same job. I make it really clear to people, um, oh, just so you know, when I do X, this is what y, this is Y happens. And I make, I try to be as transparent as possible about that so that there's no question about when, you know, there's annual review, what work looks like. And I think that it, that it is, not only existentially freeing, but I think the clarity about what, this, what is at stake has to be made really, really clear. Um, things that feel very creepy, so after the Georgetown Slavery and Memory Pride thing, I went on a TV show to talk about it, and someone sent me something that was just creepy, that was not about slavery, but seemed like they had become kind of a little fixated on something I was saying. That I actually reported, because that one did not feel like just trolling. It felt really, you know, kind of... Uh, unclear. Um, and so I think the university is supportive in the sense that, um, you know, there's no victim blaming, like, well, why'd you go on a show and talk about race? You know, there isn't that. But I do think that um, there has to be more, I think that they need more information from us as individuals about what this takes so that there can't be that kind of surprise or like sadness. Those are the two reactions that no one needs. No one needs to be sad for me, no one needs to be surprised, but there just needs to be clarity about kind of what it takes. Um, the other thing I would say about it kind of personally, I do have a whole like rubric of what I will jump into and what I jump out of. So I don't talk about things I don't know. I don't go on a show where there's like a split screen and I'm screen and I'm screaming at someone. Um, someone asked me if I wanted to be a talking head on a Bill O'Reilly like hosted thing, and I was like, I'm offended as a person, but I'm offended as a historian. Like, no, I don't go on <laughs> fake history shows. Like, this is not a real history show. Stop lying, you know. Um, and so I think that every scholar has to kind of have their standards and practices for the year, and then you revisit it. You know, um, there's some things that you're like, I'm staying out of this. This is a good example of staying in and out. So I used to work at the University of Oklahoma, and um, there was a situation with a fraternity being racist and the university's response. And I really wanted to jump into that conversation, um, but my husband, who you know is a therapist, was like, "What's your motivation with that?" And I was like, "I just want to, I just want to like avenge everything I felt wrong." I said, "I have no motivation to help the world. I'm just mad about what happened there." He goes okay, maybe this isn't a conversation you want to jump into. So I didn't jump into that conversation. I guess I'm jumping in now because it's live streamed. But <laughs> when the protests at the University of Missouri happened and I was an alum and I was concerned about some things, then I said, I'm going to jump into this conversation as someone who actually really has not only an analysis but a desire to think about this conversation in a certain way. And I think that as more and more opportunities open up to scholars to kind of you know, jump into that conversation, I think you have to have those standards. But the one thing I will say is that this is not the basis of a career. This is an opportunity to engage the content of your career. I think that for a lot of 
um, scholars who are new, you know, they're like, oh, professors on TV, this is really exciting. It is very exciting, especially if you like makeup. They do an incredible makeup job for you. You look great. And at the same time, it has to be built on a foundation of scholarship and reflection because as we see in this current moment, you know, there's a desire for an all-white nation, and so there's a desire for all-white news. All of those places where scholars of color could think out loud, thoughtfully about race, those are gone. Those days are over. You know, the, the time that someone cares what I have to say about police brutality, we're at a point where this country doesn't even believe civil rights is a thing. So if you build too much of your career on some of that public engagement, understand that that's fleeting. But what's so powerful is that when you do have those moments, the ways that you can stay engaged. I love that high school students tweet at me and they'll send me a message like, oh my gosh, I saw you on this thing and I'm really excited about going to, a col you know, go going to college to do X, Y, and Z. Like that's the work. Um, you know, and so yes, the trolling is very real. Um, and also, the thing about the trolling that is also really interesting is how well organized it is. And so you have to un like, you have to also understand that yes, it's about what you are projecting into the world, and it's being it's happening to a number of us, and we have to really like stay present with each other because then some of it can just be so overwhelming that when we can't do the work, we have to have our community to do the work for us. There's a question here, and do you want me to? Yeah, I figured. That's what I figured. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Takum Peters. Uh, I wanted to ask something about the dedicating the school year to particular events or mm -hmm. freedom struggles. Um, is that something that you still do? Um, and I, this is yeah. it's not a follow-up question, but what were some of the, the insights, but what were also some of the troubles of, of doing, doing that? So, you know, I, t I teach black history. My students kind of know what I'm bringing, and so there's never a question as to, like, what this is about. I do think the past few years, because we have just been bombarded with so much suffering and so much pain, that... Um, I, I, I call it our very long year. Do you remember in 2014, 2015, we're like, if we just get through this school year and we get some breathing space and we're gonna jump into the next year and it's gonna be so much better? Do you remember that foolishness? So, you know, every year we're like, this will be the year that things calm down in the country and I can like get my writing done, not happening, right? So, you know, when I thought about Charlottesville as structuring the year, um, you know, in 2014 it felt like it had, every class period we had to keep this very close. And now I think, okay, how are we restructuring our thinking so that we can start and then end and return to these questions? And so maybe it's a little less force. But one of the things that I thought was really powerful in teaching during 2014, 2015, two things. One is um, what became very important for me is to help students understand how I came to the conclusions that I came to. Because I had from first year students who were like, oh, I saw you in this thing talking about this, or I read this thing that you wrote, and I, I didn't want to be collapsed to a caricature. Well, this professor, of course, this is her perspective. And I'm saying, okay, but this is how history got me to this critique of the police. This is how this intellectual process got me to thinking X, Y, and Z. So that students understand that it's a kind of a robust journey rather than, you know, like, oh, you're the liberal professor. Of course you're going to think this. And the second thing that was really powerful was I wanted students to understand that this moment was fundamentally changing us and that some of it was within our control, but a lot of it was not. And so one of the things that we did right before the fall break for the Thanksgiving holiday was, or after we got back, I said, how did the killing of Mike Brown change your Thanksgiving? And so for many of the white students, they're like, what? You talk about this at Thanksgiving? Like, who does this? And the black students were like, this is the worst Thanksgiving. I was fighting with my grandparents. I was fighting with my parents. I was fighting with kids you know, back home who said this. You know, I'm done with the holidays. But I think that in our classroom discussion leading to that point, I needed people to understand that we were changing as people. And that is also part of what this does. And I think that the classroom space in the talking about it allowed us to kind of move into that insight. And I, that has been more and more helpful for me as I try to do these types of conversations either in the classroom or elsewhere. Like how, how are you changing as a result of this moment? Okay, is this time? Well, I could. Yeah. Okay. One last question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but I wanted to go back to your, and thank you again for this amazing oh. talk. 
I mean, I think that many of us here, uh, you know, would stand up and, and cheer for it because it is just remarkably nuanced, complex, and smart in every way. Um, I wanted to go back to your point, though, about the media ecology between Twitter and broadcast media. Yes. And I think that a lot of people in this room as public intellectuals understand a little bit about that media ecology, but I was just curious about what lessons you learned mm -hmm. and how can people who are trying to do social justice work in the digital humanities, like how can they take that, those lessons and use them? So I think that you have to kind of um, be prepared. I, you know, I went, to, I went to journalism school before there was a really good internet. So I did magazine writing. So that's the only thing I knew how to do. And if I were to go to journalism school today, I would know how to you know, take video, I would know how to edit. So, um, but the thing about sourcing I think is so powerful. Because what I realized was that um, there's, and th this will go to the kind of some structural stuff. So occasionally there'll be these columns in, I don't know, publications like the New York Times. Um, and someone will say, you know, social media is a waste of your time. Or if you're a serious scholar, you don't, you know, do this and these, these formats. And it's such, a, it's such a limited view of kind of what it takes for us to kind of be present. With, I think without Twitter, the, the, the platform for scholars of color just wouldn't be there. And maybe I'm wrong, but when I see the way that Twitter becomes the number one source for producers who are under 30, who are seeing a lot of things, and the way that there's a generation that has been really shaped by, their, by, by this type of learning and teaching, and a lot of it done by scholars of color. So the number of you know, students that I've taught who are now in newsrooms who are like, oh, I really want to get a quote from you because this really changed me, I think that is something that's real that I don't know if anyone's really tracking that kind of direct line. And so for, for people who are engaged in, this, in the digital humanities space, I think you just have to be prepared to be a little disappointed sometimes and to really work to clarity. I, 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 in this space, I can say this. This is why I think Twitter is really good because in the 140 characters, you have to be very clear and this is how it translates when you're doing you know, the 10 second spot, the 30 second spot, the radio show. All of this is a form of media training that you can really do in the outside world if you want to. And if it's something you don't want to do, you don't have to do it either. I think that there's some confusion as to like, one of the best parts is when you can kick it to one of your friends, be like, I don't know anything about this, but I know someone who's fabulous who can. I think media sources are more likely to ask you because they know that you're coming from a place of integrity when you say, I can kick it to another source. And so I think that you have to have a very good, you know, the basis. You have to have a very good website that's very clear. And you also have to have um, a framing device for when you talk in public that will always, that is consistent. And it might feel like, you know, for us, we're like, we're scholars. Everything we do is original. Every essay is a new opportunity. This is great. But if you ask me about something, I will always frame it in the same way to try to move an audience towards greater nuance. Um, and the other thing is that you also have to decide how you're gonna punch up or punch down. There are certain organizations I might have all sorts of issues with. I will not blast them in public because there's enough people blasting them. Like there's just a line that you have to establish about kind of what what you're gonna be used for and what you're not gonna be used for. And so, and you live and learn, and some things are false starts. I think initially with Ferguson Syllabus, I just wanted people to do it, and so I did every request, you know, every newsletter, and I thought that was fine for me. Maybe it wasn't the best use of my time, but for me, it was like, it outweighed. Now, I think I'm a little bit more discerning about spending the time, because the other tricky thing I think you also have to set a boundary with, um, I'll say this is my final thought, there's a difference between being a news source and then doing research for a news organization. And I think that sometimes in our excitement, like, oh, they're finally doing a story about, you know, about, about slavery that is touching upon this, and you find yourself like becoming the research assistant <laughs> to a news producer. So those are the things that I think over time you become more discerning about. But I think it's worth trying and I think it's worth deciding how it feels instead of saying, well, I'm not this kind of scholar, so I have nothing to say in public. You know, don't remove yourself from the conversation because you might be the voice that we've been waiting for this whole time. And you know, just don't be afraid. 
everyone's going to try to make you feel bad and scared, but there's the really, I really, really hope that you can build communities that really help you overcome that fear because clearly we are in a moment where thoughtful analysis is so precious and this is, this is what's needed right now. So with that, just with great gratitude, thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. Anything to me about it. I'm and I'll just put it up here. Okay, and then what happens if they they can come up and do that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Is that okay? Um, Check one, 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 two. Testing, testing, one, two. Mike, check one, one, two. Check one. So good morning, and I just want to say how grateful I am to have just heard uh, Professor Challen's talk because I'm not a graduate student by any means by f so many years ago, but one of those fearful of, of the digital stuff and wondering why um, Liz asked me to do this. <laughs> and seriously, because it's, I know absolutely nothing I think about it, but this is totally a learning experience for me. So hearing what you had to say really helped out a lot. And just to tell you, I'm going to introduce all these marvelous people who do know something about it and, um, and, and let them go from uh, there. So I'm starting off with Erica Cavanaugh. And um, because, because I haven't met some of you, you just threw a hand up for me. I, that, thank you. Uh, and Erica Cavanaugh is a research editor at the Washington Papers and the project developer at the Center for Digital Editing, both at the University of Virginia. Previously, she has worked for the Dolly Madison Digital Edition as well as Rotunda, the digital imprint of the University of Virginia Press. Erica's work centers on making historical documents accessible and understandable through the use of open source tools and platforms. She has co-taught uh, courses at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, Title Creating and Conceptualizing Di Digital Editions, and Drupal, I think, for Digital Humanities Projects. And then Jessica Marie Johnson, who I did meet at least, um, is an assistant professor of Africana Studies and History at Johns Hopkins University. As a digital humanist, she is interested in ways digital and social media disseminate and create historical narratives, in particular, comparative histories of slavery and people of African descent and the power of radical media to create social change. She has two works in, process, in progress. One is a history of free women of African descent laboring, living, and traveling between 18th century Senegal, Saint-Domingue, and Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast 
Louisiana. The second, in collaboration with Mark Anthony Neal of Duke University, is a compilation of work reading um, 19th century black codes against present day race coding and digital vernaculars of people of African descent. Rob Nelson, who I haven't seen in many years, but who is a former colleague uh, there, uh, is the director of the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. His current research uses a text mining technique called topic modeling to uncover themes and reveal historical patterns in massive amounts of text from the Civil War er era. He is currently completing two projects from this research, a digital project that will publish and analyze multiple topic models of Civil War era archives, that's kind of a tongue twister, right? <laughs> uh, including the Richmond Daily Dispatch and the New York Times, and an essay that analyzes these models to produce a comparative analysis of Union and Confederate nationalism and patriotism. Stephen Robertson is director of the Roy Rosenwig uh, Center for History and New Media and professor in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University. Since 2003, digital history has occupied a central place in his research in the form of Digital Harlem, which won the American Historical Association's inaugural uh, Rosenweig uh, Prize for Innovation in Digital History and the American Library Association's ABC CLIO Digital History Prize in 2010. Robertson is the author of Crimes Against Children, Sexual Violence and Legal Culture in New York City, 1880 to 1960, and co-author of Playing the Numbers, Gambling in Harlem Between the Wars. Catherine Steele is an assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland, College Park, and a scholar of race, gender, and media with specific focus on African American culture and discourse in traditional and new media. Her research has appeared in the Howard Journal of Communications and the book uh, Intersectional Internet. She is currently working on a monograph about digital black feminism and new media technologies. She also serves as the first project director for the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded College of Arts and Humanities grant, Synergies Among Digital Humanities and African American History and Culture. And last but not least, John Unsworth is the University Librarian and Dean of Librarians of Libraries at the University of Virginia and a professor in the English department. He chaired the commission that produced our cultural commonwealth a report of the American Council of Learned Societies Commission on Cyber in Infrastructure for the Humanities and Social Sciences and was a co-editor of the recent volume, A Companion to Digital Humanities. So these are our roundtable uh, folks this morning. And what I think maybe you want to do is start off with sort of introductory re remarks and can we just start uh, alphabetically or start at one end and go to the other. It's perfectly okay with me, but Erica Kavanaugh. Yeah. Um, introduction remarks as far as... Well, your, 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 your topic is, <laughs> is digital humanities in the region, so I'm, whatever it is that you want to start off dis the discussion with in terms of that, or uh, we mentioned that some of what you've been talking about is how you go forward in these areas. So I'm just asking that you, so just to sort of start the discussion, you can maybe start off talking about your thoughts about that. Um, I guess for me, if I'm thinking ab about everything that we've, we've been t discussing over the last couple of days, um, there was one comment in particular that really stuck out to me. Um, and somebody mentioned that they're working on the Georgian papers, but then they realize how is this helping with the current conversation? How is this going to help the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement? And sh they wanted to step away from what they were doing in order to try to work more in, in the modern sense. But for me, it's also about making sure that we tell those stories, mm -hmm. those past stories. The Georgian papers are gonna sit there and hit on imperialism and why it's important to, to stress that, why there's 
constantly systemic um, oppression, systemic, uh, I guess, social injustice. And while we have to highlight that and how it's constantly been a part of our history, part of our narrative throughout time, it's changed. And unless we go and bring those, bring those points forward from whatever academic field that, that we're in, it's not gonna, I don't think it's going to move forward. I don't think it's gonna get better. Because at this point, people are trying to say, well, what is the point of kneeling? Well, during the civil rights movement, they all kneeled. But you don't see that because you don't have that, historic, that historical narrative being put front and center. It's only the current movement. So constantly relating back what is currently happening right now to what has happened before and constantly reinforcing that over and over and over and retelling that narrative, I think is really important. And I think in the current times, we may be starting to miss that. I'm just about to write down some remarks in response to that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, call and response. Um, so uh, thank you again always to Liz uh, and um, William and Mary Quali Lab, Omohandro, for everybody creating this space. Um, I just want to, I think, when I'm thinking of next steps, echo what Erica is saying um, about the ways that um, the present can seem really important. The present is really, really important. Um, and what is happening um, all around our country and all around the world uh, is, um, is devastating in a lot of ways. And it can be numbing and it can be shocking. Um, and our response should absolutely be and is, I think, especially people in this room who are doing digital humanities work, to respond and think about how our projects are responsive. Um, how can our projects be in conversation? What I loved about um, uh, Dr. Chatelain's talk um, is, especially the, the, some of the final question and answer, are the ways that we are also extremely well equipped and well situated to add depth and context to what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really, really important that we take the skills that we have and um, the things that we've been spent years at this point researching mm -hmm. and apply that um, in service, but in a way that is rigorous and that is analytical and that is uh, strong. Um, so when I think about what is happening now, I always go back to the histories of slavery. Um, I always go back to the ways um, um, that enslaved women are commodified. I always go back, to, I mean, my students went um, connected Trayvon's death to a, a line in the Code Noir. And I, I gave them no instruction on doing that. I just gave them the material. But that, in some ways, is the job, part of the job, one of the jobs uh, that we have. Um, so it's in our teaching, it's in our research, it's in our projects, and our projects are constructed. I take um, Travis's comment during, um, question during my keynote very seriously, and that, you know, how do we think about how our projects are constructed in a way that is responsive to the communities that we want to be engaged in. And sometimes that is communities that, is, that are out there. Um, sometimes that, for me, I, I have a thing that, if you follow me on social media, I say it all the time, I'm accountable to the kitchen the table. For me, it's the kitchen table. For some of us, it's our classrooms. Whatever it is, we just need to do it well. Mm -hmm. And we need to do it in a way that is committed to, um, to freeing us all. Um, I also think that there are ways that we forget that, and, and I hope I emphasize that in the keynote, we forget that a lot of the best organizing and the best political action is very local. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is about our classrooms and about our campuses. Um, places like um, Oakland, like Detroit, um, Ferguson slash St. Louis, Chicago, um, what's happening in Puerto Rico now, these are communities that, that are responding because they already have deep roots in the work that is happening. So we have deep roots in our scholarship, and maybe we have deep roots in our community. I mean, maybe we do or maybe we don't. Maybe we want to build that. And organizers also have a different kind of intellectual work that they're doing. It's, it's just on the ground work. Um, and also, some of them are also publishing books and, 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 um, and teaching. And you know, so we have really interesting overlaps. But the root of it, the best of it, I think, is local. And so when we're thinking about the region and the kind of work that we want to do in the Mid-Atlantic or the kind of work that people are doing in digital humanities communities in the Midwest or in the South or in the West Coast, um, it's really important to think about what are, what communities there need and how do we build in ways that are conscientious. Um, 
and that are um, and that build links that are resilient and sustainable over years and years and years because this is not a new struggle <laughs> as we're finding, um, but it also is not it's not going anywhere. And so I think about I think about that a lot. Um, and the last thing I think about as far as next steps is taking really seriously um, what the scholars, um, the New Zealand scholars uh, from King Co from King's College, what they were saying. I'm, I apologize. I was just looking up their names to make sure I got it right, um, about the ways that we certainly want to be accountable to indigenous knowledges, but there are ways that indigenous knowledge is in digital humanities, um, and that they're correct, that they're rethinking how we think about our DH projects, um, who in our projects we're accountable to when we slow down and say we don't have enough of this or we have not gotten permission for this or we actually just heard no and we need to listen to that and not you know, process our anxiety about well we need the project done or I need a publication, whatever it is, we need to step back. Um, I think that that was really an important intervention and I just wanna bring that back to the fore as we think about how we move forward that sometimes moving forward also means thinking about how we you know, stop um, and, and appreciate the no. I think that was um, also Jackie who was saying that as well. I, um, I asked you for introductory uh, kind of statements, but certainly feel free to, to um, engage with anything that was said before. And, and I actually would also, because I, this is a learning experience for me, and I don't quite know, um, when I saw the, the, the word and the region, I sort of wondered about that. Is, is there a way that you can also, in your discussion, talk about what that means and what it means to you and what, what it just means generally for, for those of us who don't, don't actually engage with it? So, Rob, you can next, but anyway. Um, okay, I'll offer some random thoughts, and uh, one of those is to thank Liz, like everybody, and uh, thank everybody that's uh, that here. It's really wonderful to be back at William & Mary. Um, this is where I did my graduate work. Uh, some of my teachers are here, Arthur, Jackie. Uh, and uh, it felt like, uh, not just because I was here, but just because they're such wonderful talks that I felt like a student again. I learned a lot in the last few days, and uh, so this has been really wonderful to be here. Uh, uh, the, here's the random, more random part. Um, <laughs> Thinking about region, so uh, my colleagues and I have been working on a couple of projects in the last couple of years about, um, uh, they're focused on uh, racial and social justice in American cities and, and the history of, uh, of uh, federal urban policy, essentially. Uh, one of these is, some people will be familiar with, is Mapping Inequality, which is a project that maps and makes available the uh, area descriptions that were produced by the uh, New Deal agency during the 20th century that had this um, dramatic impact of uh, causing divestment in uh, both public and private in communities of color, neighborhoods of color, uh, and uh, creating investment and funneling wealth into uh, predominantly white middle class neighborhoods. Um, and right now we're getting, if we ever finish this thing, we'll be, uh, be launching a project uh, called Renewing Inequality, which uh, is a companion piece that looks at uh, displacements across the U.S. Um, through urban renewal in the uh, predominantly in the 1950s and 1960s, where uh, we have accounts of uh, 330,000 families are displaced by urban renewals, so it's over a million uh, people, uh, majority of which are people of color, uh, the vast majority of which are poor people, uh, all of whom were vulnerable. Um, the getting back to region. So the first project, uh, mapping inequality, came out of a project that uh, that was the first thing we did when I was uh, became director of the digital scholarship at the University of Richmond called Redlining Richmond, which was um, I'm a I'm I'm a loiterer in 20th century uh, urban history for sure. I'm a trained as a 19th centuryist, um, but the this was uh, when I uh, learned about this or this map was um, uh, in the surveys that were attached to it uh, came to my attention like this is a perfect thing to do for my region because I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a, <laughs> wasn't again like a 20th century, it's not a southern historian by any means, but this was a, such an evocative piece for me that I wanted to, um, and it lend itself to, dig, to a digital treatment because it's a kind of a proto database. They were collecting mm -hmm. data across neighborhoods and you could do some really interesting things with it and it was just kind of made for a digital project. Uh, and so we, we, I did that with a, um, a student intern over the course of summer in 2008, I think. Uh, and I was really happy with the impact that it had in my city, that, that uh, housing advocates would use it uh, 
uh, social just, justice-minded people would bring it up in conversations. Um, and I thought, like, this is one of 160 maps that were produced. And I, you know, if, if you're in Kalamazoo, I want this to impact, have similar impact in Kalamazoo or Akron or Tacoma or, uh, you know, you name it. There's there's a bunch of these. Uh, so we kind of put in the back of our heads that we should try and. Um, try and do a national project on this. Uh, and the reason I'm kind of bringing this up about region is that we started with our region, but we realized that these structures are national, right? These, that, and particularly housing policy, I've become particularly interested in because housing policy, I, I think I'm borrowing this from Nathan Conley, is, uh, is in some ways an imperfect analog to slavery, but it's in the 20th century, it functions probably as the kind of most important federal inst national institution that, um, that pillages, and I'm now borrowing from uh, length from Coates, uh, wealth from communities of color and funnels it to white communities. And these, again, like, are not, they weren't regional, they were uh, national structures. Okay, and then second, random thought. Uh, one thing I kept thinking about here is like, when we're doing these maps, I always find us pushing, uh, uh, in some ways back against too much complexity because we want these to be works of public history. We want people to be aware of a history that's in some ways denied. And so what I always say with the maps that we have is that I need, so, I need somebody who comes at it for two, with a two minute attenuated attention span that, uh, that, uh, that digital online environments make all of us have uh, to get that message about, um, uh, well, about, uh, the fostering of inequality through housing projects and kind of spatialization of inequalities and uh, inequities of wealth and race in American cities. Two minutes, you gotta get that, maybe not even that, a minute, you gotta come away with that story. So uh, at the same time, these have to be deep enough that somebody's really interested in this and engaged, they're finding new stuff, they're learning new knowledge, they're, they're um, an hour, two hours, three hours later, that there's some depth here. And so uh, this has been really interesting and to think about the nuance we've heard for me, uh, and, uh, and and it's kind of challenged me to think maybe maybe we're um, maybe we're doing a disservice by uh, trying to oversimplify this, and maybe we're not thinking enough about the capacity of our audience, um, and we should be challenged and to get more nuance. I, and anyways, random thought. Stephen, um, thank you, Liz. I think this is a fantastic group. I guess one of the things I'd say about region that's interesting is that this is a regional group. I mean, it's so fantastic, it feels like it can't possibly be. But these are people brought from largely institutions that can, are within driving distance of William and Mary. And, and I think that that's one of the most striking things about what is possible going forward, is that this, you know, we have simply not done this, and given who we can bring into the room from this distance, this is a very interesting region to be doing work in. And because I tend to think and have to think institutionally and organisationally in my job, one of the things that I've really been thinking about is the possibilities to bring this group together for different purposes in different ways. And I think institutionally that can be complicated because of the imperatives we work under, but I think this is a strikingly complementary group as well in terms of not stepping on each other's toes. And, and you know, I've been sitting listening to lots of things that I don't listen to. I'm by necessity in a lot of capital DH environments, which is not what's going on here. And I think that's a strength. That's a, something complementary that, that we can really build on. Um, and again, thinking from my own place, it was good to hear K-12 come into the conversation here. One of the remarkable things about, about the centre that I lead is the breadth of audiences that we deal with. You know, we are a fundamentally a digital history centre, not a digital humanities centre, which can sound like an, a narrowing of scope. But we're, you know, essentially divided into three groups, one of which works with K to 12, really K to 16 classrooms and teachers, ones that work, one that works with cultural heritage organisations, the one that works with academics. And that is a breadth we don't hear enough about in DH. Um, but it gives us, I think, a contribution to make at the regional level. You know, if you want to work with K to 12 teachers, there are very particular things you need to be thinking about. You need, you know, and I appreciated that, where we started this morning. You need to know what, this, what the curriculum is, what the teachers can and can't do. You know, you need to understand what a lesson plan is to deliver things to people in ways that are useful to them. Um, 
there's a lot of interesting regional local going on there. You know, we invariably end up working with individual schools or school districts or occasionally at the state level. And, and again, I think there's a really interesting question of scale that we can talk about if we put put K to 12 up front. That's where the Rosenspeed Centre started. It's unfortunately one of the least funded areas of work now. We started there, I think, partly because it mattered to Roy and the people he worked with, but there was also funding. NEH used to fund curriculum development. It's one of the great tragedies that it's a decade or so since they did that work, and the need for it gets more every day, and we really, Kelly Shrum runs our education division, she scrambles to find money in a way that wasn't the case before to develop the resources to do the collaborations with teachers. There's more of that through NEH for professional development for teachers. We've done some of that work. It worries me a little bit that we get to bring in a couple of dozen teachers rather than building online resources that will reach, well, based on our metrics, millions of teachers. Um, and, and I don't really know what we can do about that, but we continue to try and bridge that gap a little bit. So I'd like, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd like us to build about on the possibilities of doing region in that way um, through K to 12. And then Rob is a good transition for me. I mean, we're both mapping people. Um, and I think just there's something interesting to think about in terms there, again, I think of regional and local and scale. Um, Digital Harlem which I've been living with now for a, a tremendously long time, is quite a different kind of mapping project than Rob's. Um, and I think we always really wanted to try, um, and, and this goes back to Jessica's maps, which I always like at the beginning, you know, the classic maps of Harlem as a black place are a big black lump to mark the fact that this is a place where the population is overwhelmingly black. Um, and then nothing much else. And I think Digital Harlem was a reaction to that, an effort to create a map that captured individual places and individual events and individual lives underneath that kind of lump. Um, and it's, you know, the follow-up project that Rob's talking about is somehow bridging his work in that, that there are individual stories in urban environments to be told that our ways of thinking about place don't often tell. And, and, and I think the story is told from the individual level up and then moving up in scale is something that is really powerful and that we need to be looking to bridge scale. Local stories are powerful. I, you know, I'm an old school social historian. I work from the ground up. But I also worry about the ability of people to move from the local to the broader questions, to engage with some of the more systematic and structural things that are going on there, to think comparatively, to think out of their communities and to other places. So I think that, that really thinking about how we move scale up, I think, is important. We have, amongst the many things we do at the moment, a grant from IMLS to work with public librarians to develop local history and local history skills in their communities. And, you know, that's a project that I'm working on and trying to think about how to get people to frame questions about their communities that connect those communities to larger patterns rather than the very, very local stories that they intrinsically want to tell is part of what we want to help people do in that setting. Yes, let's talk about, you know, the people and places of your community, but let's also say, talk about how your community responded to the First World War, how your community responded to suffrage, how your community responded to civil rights. Tell the big local stories as well, and I think helping people make that shift in scale is perhaps like Rob was talking about, one of those things, the hooks, the opportunities we get. It, it's a local story, it matters, but it's got to be part of a bigger story if people are going to then begin to develop some of those senses of connection and empathy that somehow we're destroying um, hook, line and sinker. I think I, I can't finish without saying that it's kind of remarkable to be in Virginia as the third New Zealander that people are here <laughs> from. Um, it's, a, it's a truly kind of bizarre thing. At least it gives me some confidence that people might be able to interpret my accent a little bit faster <laughs> and the kind of diasporic New Zealand DH community that exists out there. But there's also a level of discomfort. Digital Harlem is a project conceived in Australia and we are, you know, at some level should be all grateful that we solicited several million Australian dollars worth of funding to develop African American history, you know, led by Shane White, who spent in a, a very distinguished career working on African Americans in New York. But it's a project of white people separated by the Pacific um, from the community we work in. Um, and there's a level of discomfort. And, you know, I really appreciated Jackie's challenge to our discomfort 
um, earlier on to try and work out what we do about that without giving up our work. But I think we are, and again, you know, we were reminded this morning, we're stepping into a space where we need to be able to say why we're doing this, who we're doing this for, who we're engaged with. Historians are appalling at doing that. Um, digital history's made people more willing to do it. I think a lot of historians' reluctance to engage with digital history is a reluctance to be that self-conscious about what they do and who they're talking to and not talking to, without saying that everybody has to talk to everyone. I have no problems with scholars talking to scholars, and I'm really uncomfortable with the notion that a scholarly audience is not an appropriate audience. But by the same token, I'm uncomfortable with people who think somehow they can write better and immediately be talking to other audiences. So we have to be self-conscious about what we're doing in ways that I think is not comfortable for people. Um, but as a starting point, it's not an ending point. It's not a place not to do things. It's a place to do a different kind of engaged scholarship. Uh, so I want to talk about region um, maybe a little bit differently at first and then come back to how we've been talking about region because I think what Jessica has said and what Erica has said and what our, I mean everyone's kind of been circling around this idea of doing the work that we're trained to do and being comfortable in doing the work that we're trained to do. And so the idea of region and staying in one's region, which I usually use as my lane, right, is a really important um, idea for me. And I think it's an important idea that I hear echoed at this conference. And it's an important idea that I think is a good takeaway for us, is to recognize our strengths, to recognize what our training is and what our capacities are as a result of that, um, and, and to work in those ways. And to not apologize for working in the space where we've been trained, where we have expertise, where we can offer the most to the academy and to the world. Um, but also not being afraid of being around other folks as they operate in their lanes and taking from them what is useful so that we can coexist in parallel ways. And so that's what I've taken a lot of um, at this gathering is people who are very comfortable in their space and are happy to articulate what that space is. Um, and I think the more of that that we're able to do as folks who study the digital, as folks who are capital DHers and not capital DHers, as a community of scholars who are interested in similar things but are doing them in very different ways, I think the better off we are as a result of that. So my lane, right, is not a big DH, uh, big D DH, right? <laughs> That's not who I am. That's not who, how I was trained. Right? So I was trained as a digital scholar, a person who was a humanist but is deeply interested in the digital. Right? And so I try to articulate that when I'm in DH spaces because I think it's important that I say that and I say that this is what I am trained to do and I'm good at doing, but I'm deeply interested in the lane of DH. Right? And I'm de deeply interested in the work that's being done there. And I'm deeply interested how those lanes should and can be in conversation with one another. So when I think about region, I'm thinking about it in that space. Right? I'm thinking about the region in which we operate in our academic region and our regions of expertise and how those interlap and, over and intersect with each other and how we need to be comfortable where we are but also comfortable in what we don't know and in asking people to do the things that they know how to do that we don't know how to do, right? Which was articulated this morning. So when I don't know a thing, it's okay to say, but I know someone who does. And so when we think about next steps for now our actual geographic region, that's what I see as I'm putting now on my like administrator hat of like, here's how we move forward, right? Um, is, is maybe this is how we move forward, is that we have a collective of people of these kind of separate but interrelated lanes who have some sense of conversation with each other sometimes, but not in a way that you know some of us have within our disciplines, right? We have a regularly occurring conference that happens every year. We have um, particular areas in which we publish. We sometimes, all of us, kind of publish in different places. And we're not always aware of those spaces. We're not always aware of one another's work. We're not always aware of one another's expertise. So how do we best make use of the fact that we're in this space right now and that each of us have particular kinds of institutional backing. It looks different for each of us, right? Like some of us are, that's carrying money. Some of us that's carrying centers. Some of us that's carrying programs. Some of us are carrying graduate students. Some of us are carrying all these different things that we're, we're bringing from our institutions. How do we best then make use of that as a collective community? Where I can say, I have this, but I don't have that, right? Like I have, I have a space, I have a center, right? Where I can host this, but I don't have the funds to bring 
so-and-so to campus, or I have a program with graduate students who are trained in this, but I've got nowhere to send them when they finish doing this work. So who do I send them to? Or who can serve as an external person on a committee? Who can I give a space to to speak who doesn't usually get spaces to speak, but is doing the work? So how do we utilize the structures that we have, the, the bits of privilege and power that we're afforded in our different kind of regions, right, to bring this together as a community moving forward. And that's what I'm really interested in uh, about the conversation that I hear happening here. It's really exciting for me to be in a geographic region where all this is happening. But I would love for us to be in con commune and conversation with each other much more regularly as a result of making use of that geographic space. And what does that look like, right? So I've already had conversations with people here about, oh, well, how do we use our resources together on this? Why don't we do that? Why don't we come up with a shared collective document that lives online where we can actually articulate what those resources look like and how we can best access the resources of people at other institutions and the resources of our minds and the resources of the academic endeavors that we're engaged in? How do we access the resources of folks who have been really successful with grant work and those who have not been really successful? And how do we make use of sharing that knowledge across folks who are doing race-based DH work, right? So that we are collectivizing that knowledge that we're saying, like, I'm not just good at this in my corner, but how can we be good at this together and how can we make use of this? And I always come back to, for our students, so many of our students exist in programs that are so separate um, from th what they're doing is so separate from all their colleagues. Like so many of us came up in these programs, right? Where we're doing this thing that is not like any of anything else that's happening in our department. And we don't have faculty who are you know, able to provide the kind of guidance and support that we need. And so some of us you know, make shift, figured out how to snatch up mentors. I snatch mentors wherever I go. I'm looking at y'all, y'all know who y'all are. <laughs> so I, wherever I go, y'all are with me now forever, that's it. Because that's how you learn how to do that when you don't have that. But we need to pass that knowledge on and we need to make life a little bit easier and a little bit more straightforward for our graduate students so that they don't have to maybe do all of that extra labor of crafting committees out of nowhere, right? And crafting mentoring networks that didn't exist. So we're here now, right? So how do we do that? And that's what I would love for us to have time to talk about. So I'll stop talking now so we can all talk together. Can I just um, jump in just to second all of that that um, Catherine was just saying, and also reiterate again, because it makes me think of the American Studies panel, mm -hmm. and the ways that there is capital DH, when we know that it's centered in, in, in Europe and Canada, and there's ways that like it's, it is what it is, but we have this opportunity, like just thinking mm -hmm. about the conversations here and the kinds of things that are being built in this region, in American Studies DH, to do this different, yes. you know, and so we, we, absolutely need to be thinking about the networks that we create and the structures that we put in place, but we should also be thinking about how we want to do it in a way that is not like yeah, yeah. Um, Capital DH, or take the best of what is happening in Capital DH and also add on that we are accountable to um, this community or mm -hmm. we're accountable to a different kind of practice or we want to make sure that um, our grad student populations are extremely diverse mm -hmm. or that our undergraduates are engaged in um, community work to the extent they want to be. Like we can actually think about those conversations yeah. because this is where this actual DH work is coming out of. And so I, it's a really great opportunity. And unapologetically redefine things in the way that we need to, right. right, to make space for what it is that we want to do. Right. So when I talk about DH work, I say, well, I'm a humanist who does digital, so why am I not a digital humanist, right? Like I wouldn't be considered that by a lot of folks, but my work is humanities based. I'm deeply engaged with the digital. Like, that's, you know, digital humanities, sure, right? And so why not redefine these terms and redefine these structures when and where we can? We can in this space, we can take that back to other spaces. And I think you're right, it has it carries weight, right, when we're able to, to, to do that. Good morning, thanks everybody for being here and thanks for inviting me to join you. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here yesterday. Clearly missed a very interesting day, uh, more interesting than the day that I had. Uh, back at the University of Virginia. Um, I was interested this morning in um, Marsha's emphasis on the humanities and on resisting forgetting. Uh, resisting forgetting is what cultural institutions, cultural heritage institutions do when they're working well. Sometimes they help forgetting when they're not working well. Um, but this is a particularly important moment in which to <clears throat> resist forgetting. There are a lot of things to resist in this moment, but forgetting is certainly right up there. Um, in Charlottesville, 
uh, on August 11th and 12th. Um, we saw a lot of things that uh, people, some people had forgotten, um, and uh, that, you know, people, honestly, I, I think people on the ground there um, didn't really believe still existed in that way, and that was a paradigm shift, that uh, set of events. Um, it's not that uh, people didn't know that those things still existed. People did know. Um, black people certainly knew, um, but I think there were a lot of uh, well-meaning uh, liberal white people who didn't see that in their everyday lives and uh, didn't remember uh, that uh, that was still very much part of the culture. Uh, we were scheduled as a cultural institution uh, to open an exhibition on August 14th uh, focused on the bicentennial year of the University of Virginia. Uh, it was about the university and 100 objects. And uh, one of the most prominent of those objects uh, was a burned cross. And the burned cross is in our collection because we got it with a bunch of faculty papers. And it came to us with the faculty papers because it was burned on the lawn of a faculty member whose wife, during massive resistance, wrote the Saturday Evening Post uh, a letter suggesting that Southerners might actually like desegregation once they got used to it. Um, and this was the, the response. We had been gearing up for this exhibition, as you can imagine, for quite some time before those events. Uh, but what happened on August 11th and 12th uh, obviously caused us to stop and reconsider uh, whether we were going to open the exhibition on schedule and whether we were going to open it with that object. Um, and uh, I had a brand new incoming head of special collections, uh, Brenda Gunn, who started on August 28th, um, coming to us from the Briscoe Archives at the uh, University of Texas at Austin. And so you know, I had a, a new person who was coming in who was going to own this exhibition, really. And the exhibition was supposed to be up for an entire year. Uh, the exhibition is based on a book that we didn't write, so our list of 100 objects was already given. Um, there was uh, really no way to navigate uh, this situation um, without making obvious public choices. Um, I polled some people by email, uh, former students, uh, black activists who'd graduated recently from the university, um, people on the faculty, people in the community, uh, and I had help from uh, particularly my research archivist, um, Irvin Jordan, who went out to the community and talked to people about this and solicited opinion. And from the point of view of resisting forgetting, the response was really interesting. Um, the people who were closest to the academy, uh, regardless of age, race, or uh, professional status, all pretty much said, this is part of history. We can't whitewash history. You have to open with this. Uh, people have to confront this. The people in the community, the farther away we got from the academy and the more we got to the barbershops, the people in the community said, um, that's not history. Uh, that's my childhood. And you have to be out of your mind if you think, you know, if you're even considering opening this exhibition at this point with that object in it. And I just thought that in the context of resisting forgetting, that particular range of responses in that situation uh, was very interesting. Um, clearly, uh, there was no danger in that second audience that they would have forgotten. That wasn't the problem that they were dealing with. <laughs> the problem that they were dealing with was being reminded of something that they hadn't forgotten that you know, was still extremely painful. Um, what we ended up doing uh, was opening the exhibition, and I hope you'll come see it. Actually, uh, it's, it's up all year. Um, opening the exhibition uh, without the cross, but with the case that we had designed, uh, which very carefully designed to make it photograph proof, um, and with a sign explaining why we'd removed the item, and with some photographs of the events of August 11th and 12th, one featuring um, a sort of memed photo of giant Tyler McGill, who was uh, one of the librarians, uh, the librarian who got injured and subsequently had a stroke um, after being beaten on August 11th by the Jefferson statue. He's recovering. Um, he'll be back 
Um, but there was a picture of Tyler, and then there was a picture of the candlelight vigil that was held on the lawn a few days later, which uh, that's my front lawn. I live on the lawn, and that was a very impressive event and underreported, um, I have to say. The numbers that were quoted were way, way off. Um, so no one has objected to that to date, um, but we're not done with that either. Um, I, you know, I see this as the beginning of a conversation with the community about um, beginning with the cross and, and um, you know, how to deal with that, but then expanding out to a larger set of conversations about curating hate, about cultural institutions that have important records in, in their collections that are uncomfortable, distasteful, uh, but need to be uh, remembered and considered and, um, and, and learned from. So, you know, I'm hoping in that set of conversations to bring in some people from places like the Jim Crow Museum where, you know, they deal with this every day and there are other institutions that have um, experience in that. Um, I'd like to bring in some people to talk about um, decentering whiteness in exhibitions, especially in a majority white institution that can be, uh, that's not something that happens by accident and, um, you know, how have people managed to, to do that. Um, I'd like to have a, a, a final panel discussion uh, with people from Canada, Australia, Germany, South Africa, about how other countries have navigated the sort of the, the question of their own history and the monuments uh, to, to their past and uh, how they have reconciled. We tend in America to think that we're unique, uh, that we're the only people who ever had these problems, whatever they are, and that you know, no one else has any solutions for us. We clearly think that on health care. We think that on lots of other things. Um, I think there are uh, things that we could definitely learn from in the history of other countries, and I think um, broadening that perspective to an international perspective would, would help our conversations in some way. Now, to the question of uh, region, libraries are great. Um, I'm, I run a library, and libraries are great at uh, consortial action. They're some of the best consortial actors in the university, actually, and they have generally uh, become that because uh, they don't have the resources to do everything that they need to do by themselves, so they team up and they team up on the acquisition of resources and on resource sharing. So some of the most effective regional organizations that now exist across our universities are things like FIBA, which is the Virginia Academic Library Consortium. It, can, it includes uh, community colleges uh, all the way to research universities, and um, it's a group uh, that William and Mary and, and Virginia both belong to and where uh, we license uh, some expensive resources that uh, really do spread the wealth uh, from the richer institutions like mine, which carry a larger part of the burden of those subscriptions, to license things for the state so that you know, larger um, uh, groups with less money can also have access to some of those. Um, I think figuring out uh, there's a close relationship historically between DH, um, capital, camel case, or lower case. Um, and libraries, and I think uh, that working through these regional organizations uh, would make sense. There, I know from being at meetings of the library directors that there's broad interest across this consortium in that. So, you know, figuring out where we could leverage uh, those existing consortial relationships would be good. One thing that I've tried to introduce into our consortium is a project that I've been working with since 2008. Uh, called the History Makers. It's this uh, oral history project out of Chicago, an independent nonprofit that uh, Juliana Richardson runs. She's been doing long form oral histories of African Americans in many different walks of life for about 10 years now, and she's about halfway through what she wants to do. Uh, she's, I've been working with her in the last couple of years uh, with some Mellon funding on uh, getting this into uh, the libraries and the classrooms in higher education where it really hasn't had a profile and hasn't had an audience. And um, it's a terrific uh, resource. I recommend it to your attention, uh, as Juliana says, not just for African American studies. Uh, there are 200 scientists interviewed in this collection. Uh, they're about their career as scientists and coming up and how, how they did that. Uh, there are uh, businessmen, there are 
um, politicians, they're people in all walks of life. So really broadly um, useful in the curriculum. And for research, it's fully transcribed, searchable. So if you work with oral history resources, this is probably the easiest oral history resource you could possibly work with just because uh, it's so searchable. So, you know, I think there are things that um, libraries can do individually. I think there are things that libraries can do collectively in, in concert uh, with DH and, and libraries already act regionally. So uh, going forward, let's figure out how to do some of these things together. I um, just I don't I, before we do some questions there. I just wanted to to say that um, when I looked at the the title of this uh, roundtable and saw the word region, and I was thinking geographically, uh, primarily that's what came to mind. Mm -hmm. But all of you have talked about it in a way that suggests that the digital humanities itself is probably a region. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if you feel that, and, and if you could address this a little bit in your discussion of digital humanities as a region, if it's, do you think it's, it's a better way to get open conversation about race, issues of race? People don't like to talk about race. I mean, that's not anything new that I'm telling anybody. <laughs> but they're more comfortable talking about anything else, sex, sexism, gender, gender stuff, anything but racial issues. And even some of your own conversation, um, uh, particularly John, when you were talking about what happened in, in Charlottesville, it was sort of those things that happened and how do we, you know, it's like not calling it what it is. And so I'm wondering just if the digital humanities is a way to get people to be open about it and talk about it specifically and maybe try to resolve it in that way. And so if you could just kind of address that issue. Can I say short answer, no? And, and not, in a, not in a really like, that's not a great idea way, but just in the way of people don't like talking about race because it makes us deeply uncomfortable with dealing with aspects of ourselves and with our country and with the institutions and the structures that we're a part of. And in that way, I don't think that there is a fix in digital humanities mm -hmm. that takes any of that away. Mm -hmm. um, it is a tool, just like we have other tools that we use to do the work that we need to do, right? And so part of our toolkit can be the digital humanities in terms of accessibility, in terms of bringing other folks into the conversation, in terms of making our, our research more uh, available. Like there are things that we can do with DH, right, um, as a part of our toolkit. But I think that any mechanism to dismantle white supremacy, because let's name that, right, like mm -hmm. as that, right, or to dismantle um, heteronormativity, to dismantle patriarchy, to dismantle hypercapitalism, like we, when we name those things, DH doesn't do that, mm -hmm. right? But we, as actors within a system, chip away at things with the tools that we have and the spaces that we, you know, are bound within. So that's like just a short kind of, not, not a sad answer, right? But like I think it's a real answer to how we work within the spaces that we have to break into and to break apart from and to break apart the things that we wish to break apart. Anyone else? Um, well, I'm gonna, so, I, I don't know if it's any better than anything else, right? But I'm not sure it's any worse than anything else. And like, I'm just gonna yeah, read one hate, right. a little shitty example about this. Uh, so uh, Mapping Inequality got some decent press. One thing was an NPR story, got reprinted in this, I was unfamiliar with this, this website, AmericanRenaissance.com. You think that would, somebody better would have gotten the name for that, but that's <laughs> fine. It's a right-wing site, they reprinted it. And the first comment was, which I find both disheartening and, yeah, I find it mostly disheartening. That's right, let's zone out on something that happened 80 years ago that was fully repudiated 50 years ago, historical racism porn, right? So, I mean, this is just a problem we have, I'm not saying anything profound here, problem we have in our society where you know, we have this kind of closed-minded ideological mm. uh, perspective that's often, you know, decidedly racist. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I won't even get to the hateful ones. I mean, that was the one of the more thoughtful ones on the, <laughs> that common thread. So, which is both discouraging on the other hand, there's been some really thoughtful engagement with the site, and um, I mean, this is just kind of the importance of the work that we do. We have to 
we have to do the best we can to educate people and have a con have a conversation. And there's certain people aren't going to listen, yeah. right? And that's unfortunate. Um, and yeah, and that's not anything to do with digital anything. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it's the trolling that happens on sites. I don't know. Maybe it's worse on, in, in, in a digital realm than it is uh, elsewhere. Hard to imagine that's the case, but maybe it is. I mean, but as a tool, I mean, we use what we have. So I have students that are interested in the digital, and so that's a, an entry point, right, into having other conversations about other things, right? So I, didn't, I don't say that to say, like, oh, it's, you know, uh, Right, but no, like we, I bring people in using what brings them in, right? And this is what we do as instructors, as teachers, right? Is that whatever, whatever gets you in the door, right? Whatever gets you here to the mm -hmm. place where we're now going to have the conversations we need to have, right? So you're interested in Twitter? Cool. Let's talk about Twitter, and then let's talk about harassment, and then let's talk about, right? So like we can use the thing that you have interest in to then have the conversations that we need to have to build knowledge, to craft better you know, citizens in a democracy to craft better in people who engage with one another in thoughtful ways. So absolutely, right? Mapping inequality is a great example of people being drawn in by what this can do and this interesting and presenting something in a way that now draws the interest, right? It also draws the, the trolls, right? But it draws the interest, right, of folks. And I want to learn how to map things. Oh, we're going to map inequality, right? <laughs> and so that becomes a, an entry point, I think, for a lot of folks. I want to... Um to think about these together, actually. Because um, I, I agree, DH is a tool, especially capital DH. But DH, the, the humanities, the, the digital humanities, these are tools. Um, I also think there's something really interesting if we think of DH as a region, if we think of the US DH context, at least, of the possibility there and what could be. So if, if, if DH is a tool, um, what in, in what ways uh, is American studies and digital humanities coming out of a U.S. context? And I mean U.S. in all of its you know messed up imperial, colonial, um, genocidal aspects. Um, what can we offer it? You know what are the ways? And I guess I can just be really plain. Like I think that there's ways that we have built a a set of scholarly tools in critical ethnic studies, in black studies, in women's studies, in indigenous studies that actually can transform yes. how we use the tools. And that is our contribution, I think, to DH as this regional DH in this larger DH global situation. Like I think the US, I think us in the US and us in this region should be committed to doing anti-racist work in that way. And that then transforms um, how we use the tool. So like maybe not the tools itself, but there is, there is some interesting synergy here between the DH that's happening in the US context and the kind of transgressive, transformative justice aspects of DH that, that have been able to happen in the caucus that, um, that create these other kinds of spaces that let us think about DH in at least those four ways that I suggested um, and a whole host of other ways. So I'm gonna give like two quick examples. One is, along with what, what people have already presented, um, one is thinking of, even in this region, I, and it, I don't want to forget to mention this, of course, um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mm -hmm. So A, in this region, we have the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. We also now have the Blacksonian. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and this is really important, not just because it is a center of um, of museum, archive, research, cultural life now. If anybody has not gone to visit, it really is a center of cultural life. Um, the, uh, the people around it, I think museums, um, I was at uh, Rethinking Slavery, uh, which was uh, a symposium um, done by Jasmine Cobb at, um, at Duke, and um, one of the curators was there. And one of the things she mentioned is that the usual estimate of time walking through museums anywhere in the Smithsonian is about two hours. People are sp stopping and taking six hours mm -hmm. to walk through the museum. It's why you can't get tickets. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the Hamilton of the Smithsonian. And so, you know, it's important to think about, like, that has become a cultural hotspot for the entire United States, and especially for those invested in African American history. But again, turn us on a pivot. Black history is US history. One of the reasons, like, the, the, that museum has been in the works for years. I remember visiting, an, a, a, as a graduate student in 04, um, Lonnie Bunch gathering some of the graduate students from University of Maryland and having us there. So that's been in the works for a very long time. One of the reasons that it, it, it was able to have such a strong 
national presence and being our national imaginary well before it opened was a social media team. Mm -hmm. And, and these, these are not necessarily people who are invested in capital DH or lowercase DH or anything, but these are people who in this country, <laughs> in the US, or related to the US, have been thinking about social media and the relationship that it has to black community and cultural formations for years. So I want to definitely shout out Lene Spruce. I want to shout out uh, Raven uh, Ruffin, who are both part of the social media team there. I know I'm missing other people, my apologies. Um, but they have did amazing work. And so there is something happening here in how we use digital tools, both out of our investment in social change and transformative justice, but maybe also out of the way of the kind of access to technology. For better or for worse, Twitter is still a very Western tool. It's still in English. The alphanumeric logics of it are still um, based on, sorry, <laughs> um, you know, certain kind of uh, language formations. And so there, you know, and you know, and I've said this before in other, in other spaces, other pieces, the alter egos especially in particular, there's a way that radical women of color work, um, the queer work has generated an energy around social media that mm -hmm. still remains to be fully appreciated. But there's a reason why we like Twitter. There's a reason why people have hashtag black Twitter. And it is not just, you know, because Twitter got created. People made that happen. And so there's something happening here and that it's about people's commitment to justice and to transforming the world. Um, and we can use that in community and in conversation and appreciating the ways that that stretches how we think about humanities and media and practice in all of these different things. So it's not a matter of coming in and saying, well, now we're going to take it. It's a matter of thinking about our context is so much larger. And if we don't, you know, if we can't open up into all of those ways, um, we, we just, I don't know, we risk replicating a kind of DH that, that is a problem. But there is some, I guess I want to suggest that there is something really magical here, and I don't want to um, discount that, and I think that maybe that is what you were sensing in your, in your question, um, Jacqueline. Can we open it up now for questions in the audience? Is that appropriate? Hi, um, a little nervous, sorry guys. Um, I um, was thinking about everything that we were, you were talking about and um, John hit on one, you know, talking about the, the cross. Mm -hmm. And I started out before Ferguson, I had a diverse group of friends. I thought everything was good. Ferguson happened. My heart broke for people that I knew that I knew were going through this and that weren't saying anything. And the, so um, on my social media, when I put on Black Lives Matter, tons of people, I mean, I probably lost a third of the people that I had on social media. I thought, they're not even willing to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I have a region of people that are not even willing to engage in the conversation. They have just backed out. And I think about the cross, and I think about museums in the area where I am, which is in Oklahoma, and they have some smaller museums. and. Wondering how, in DH space, we can get the message across without the spectacle. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't become a spectacle rather than information. And if you could speak to that. Can you say more about the spectacle and more about what you that the space is designed so that people come just to see the, the horror or the shock of it rather than mm -hmm. the getting the information. I see. Mm. Hmm. I mean, this is probably in some ways the least exciting way to respond to this, but, but I guess to, one of the things that, that it makes me think about is, is the form in which we present material. Um, and, and we really haven't used the capacities of the digital form. I mean, you know, I started paying attention to this in the 1990s in the great era of hypertext when, um, and, you know, when you showed us the AQ issue back from that era. And then for reasons that I'm, you know, I would love somebody to unpack at some point, we kind of gave that up. We got WordPress, we got content management systems. Um, 
we got too comfortable, you know, we didn't really want to think out of the way we did stuff. And, and it's an ongoing frustration that we continue to pour resources into things that do as little as possible to change the form of what we do. Um, and, you know, we're, while we try to save the historical monograph, you know, we create historical e-books as if that is, you know, engaging with what is possible in the digital. Um, so I, I, I think part of our, our struggle here is to come up with a form that people will engage with. And, you know, and I take Rob's point, I mean, you, you know, you look at the metrics for some of the sites that we build to embrace the complexity that's possible in the digital, and it's depressing mm. as all hell. You know, one to two minutes is, is what we can get from most people. And, and any site that goes beyond that, and, you know, and Lauren was talking about the metrics on Photogrammer, which, are, you know, are considerably longer and longer than any other... DH project I'm aware of in terms of what people will do and how they will be in, are engaged in terms of the explorations that they're clearly doing through that side of photographs from, from the 1930s that can be explored regionally and through a map interface and various things like that. So, so in terms of trying to engage people in a different kind of way, we have to be more creative. We have to shed ourselves of some of the um, of, of the baggage of what we brought to it. The book we used to read in the 1990s on this was Janet Murray's book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, mm -hmm. which should be a book that, whose time has passed, but it's a book that I've gone back to assigning to my students because it's a book that challenges us with what are the capacities of the digital that we should be building on mm -hmm. as opposed to bringing all of our other stuff to it. And, and we, gotta, we have to go back to that. And I think we have to go back to it because of all of the problems we have with the way that people will respond to our material otherwise. We have to think about what we can do with the form and we have to think about in, in, in the way that is central to our practice at the centre what audiences we want to reach. We can't reach an amorphous and undefined public. We can't match an amorphous and undefined community. And, you know, and I, the question that I wanted to ask at our very first roundtable was that really interesting conversation between the old school community history that Lee's presented mm -hmm. and the much different kind of sense of community that fandom represents. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and maybe this speaks to the comment that Jessica just made. Community means something different online mm -hmm. in a way that I don't know that we entirely understand. And while I, you know, while, while I think your point's absolutely fine, DH is a tool the approach to it is the same as everything else. But it is a, a tool that exposes us mm. in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, mm. For better or for worse, we weren't trolled in print. Give or take, <laughs> give or take the odd bad book reviewer. Mm, yeah. um, but what, what the trolls thought of what we did wasn't out there. Um, and maybe they never saw it. Maybe they did see it. I don't think we really know. But... And, and I don't, and I have misgivings about the amount of attention that we pay to trolls. And, and again, I thought this Twitter as a source of what drives our news horrifies me. And, and the fact that increasingly I, I open up mainstream news media to read a story that turns out to be a string of tweets that a reporter has found worries me depending on who, what those tweets are. Uh, but one way or another, there is a, a kind of visibility and a kind of opportunity there that I think we're missing because we're not really... We just haven't got very far in, in exploring what the digital does. And if we're going to reach people through it, mm -hmm. we're going to have to reach them through it, not by trying to weird your old stuff into it. Is there a question? Yeah, I just want to comment on that. Yes, yes, yes. And, and so I wonder also if we underestimate the ways in which um, circuits of intimacy and exchange allow, um, this isn't a critique, this is an ad, right, to, yeah. right, um, uh, th th allow us to solidify relationships in this room, right, for example, I, you know, I don't, I didn't know Catherine, but I knew her online. Right, and I, I assume there's an intimacy that happened between us because of that politics of exchange, of retweeting. I didn't know Lauren, right? But you know, but I, I have been part of the conversations, or 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 uh, read part of the conversations that allowed me to to figure out a politics and a community that had yet to be accessed, right? So I, I wonder about root systems that are growing underground before they sprout. 
Um, and I wonder about the ways in which these physical and digital spaces allow us to create next steps, which is where I'd love us to go back to, too. Um, allow us to create next steps within a kind of um, community of trust or place, back to region, right? We know sort of, we have a sense of where people's lanes are before we meet these people, right? You know, to be quoted with Rob in a piece, right? It creates an affinity that allows us to have a different set of conversations, to have an inner invitation, even that I didn't follow through on from Stephen, right? Allows us to, to think about next steps in community and connection in a way that we wouldn't have without um, digital spaces. So how do we access that in our next steps is my question to the panel. I mean, I guess that you've sort of answered. I mean, I think we were doing that already, um, you know, and I do think that, you know, even at the more mundane levels that you described, the, 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 ability, the visibility of people on Twitter creates the possibility to build further connections. Um, and DH has been on Twitter for a while. Um, capital DDH, you know, other forms of DH, I think, are native to Twitter in a way that capital DH maybe isn't. But, but it's, it is a space where we all are. And, and, and again, I think that's a really important corrective. The trolls come for us, but our people come for us mm -hmm. on Twitter. And I would never step off Twitter for that reason, um, that you can find people and you can build ties and that people build um, supportive relationships. But again, I mean, and Catherine and I were talking about this before, it is now, I think, the, the modern conference experience is to go into physical spaces right. to meet people that you actually know on Twitter <laughs> and then have that weird moment where you realise that you've never actually met them. Um, and then, you know, and I guess maybe this is a warning to people to have good Twitter avatars because at some level I often meet people that don't look anything like their avatar, which is what I'm relying on, and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to build those other ties. So I think that's... That's kind of happening anyway, and I think that you know there's something really interesting to explore in terms of how we take our virtual networks into physical spaces and back and forwards. And, and a step forwards thing I think is kind of interesting. What what do we get from each of those places? Mm -hmm. And so when do we want to come together face to face, you know? And then and then how and then what do we want to do on you know in places like Twitter and, and what to do, we do that? Do intentionally online, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I think so much of the networking that has happened and that happens is through other systems by which. We're connected, right? So I, I know Jessica online because of being in other, you know, we talked about the black professors, it's kind of quiet network online, right? So there's ways that I kind of know of people's work or know who they are in online spaces. But doing good online networking and brand management is a job. Like these oh are gosh, things that people, job. this is a skill set. This is not something you fall into. The people who have all these thousands of Twitter followers and manage their brand accordingly, they do it because that is work. They have That's, brand managers. That like is, they have people. That is work, okay? And it is, it is skilled labor and work. And so if we want to do that as a community, then we need to be invested in it as labor and as work that we're willing to engage in or hire someone to do who has the skill set to do, right? Like, so let's not assume that like, cause we all kind of know stuff about Twitter and digital, like that, no. We know some stuff. We don't know how to do maybe the thing that we need to do, which is craft an intentional online network of scholars and scholarship that does X, Y, and Z as our goals. So like, let's name what the goals are. Let's figure out who has the skill set to do that, right? Maybe they're in this room, but maybe they don't have the time if they're in this room, right. right? And so like, let's be intentional about the online network. So it's not just like, I happen to know half the people here. It's here is how we manage this online so that we are in conversation, so that I can alert you when this is happening, so that we are following one another so that this hashtag means this thing because that is what people do who do this successfully right it is they don't fall into it um, and so you know this this is this is what here I'm going back to it just this is what black women do online really well um, and that are not have not historically been recognized for but the astute marvelous skillful craftful way that black women have managed their Twitter presence and their their engagement with technology right um, it is intentional and it's skillful. It is not, I happen to be good at a thing, right? Mm. And so I think that we need to be intentional and skillful and not hope that somebody who happens to be good at a thing makes it happen for us if we want to move forward as a network together. I just want to add on to that, but and also flip that on the other side because 
that's also labor that black women have been doing yes. and in the real world and is often rendered as invisible gotcha. labor. It's, it's labor that um, women of all colors have done mm -hmm. across you know, professional networks. Like it's rendered invisible labor or service, particularly in the academy, but it's invisible labor in all of our lives, just kind of keeping things running, right? Um, but I also want to think about Gabrielle's question and, and the ways that we have, have used social media in DH um, and in creating community well beyond you know, anything related to DH. Um, uh, so um, Johns Hopkins, where I'm at, um, I'm on the Dean's Digital Task Force. And one of the things that we're trying to create is a digital scholarship lab. And the person leading that is Tamsin Rose Steele, amazing librarian. We have amazing librarians there, Shannon Simpson, Margaret Burry, um, Steph Gamble. Like, I'm, I'm missing a whole bunch of people. Apologize if anybody is watching from Hopkins. <laughs> um, but I did want to kind of think about how, you know, I did want to bring that to the table because there are also ways that the intentional kinds of communities that have been created that I, it's many of us, I hope, but I certainly um, see and have helped create around in, in different spaces in social media um, that we are all, you know, very excited about and feel warm and fuzzy feelings about, we can also translate that into the real world and think about how does that translate in our digital administrative structure. So the Digital Scholarship Lab that um, that we are working on at Hopkins is also, we're also trying to make it a space where we create intentional community, where it is actually a lab space for those who are related to the Digital Scholarship Lab, where it's a space where difference and systems of oppression are openly discussed, that it's a safe space, that people have what they need, and that it's, it's like a physical geography, yeah. you know? So it's a way, so in some ways, you know, we are so maybe so used to social media and those and those networks that we forget that we actually can replicate that in the real world too, and that that can be a symbiotic relationship back and forth. Also, again, the gift that American DH can give to the world, um, but that we should remember that you know that that's that that is something that can happen you know in real physical space, and that you know di our digital scholarship lab, the Equality Lab, the Scholars Lab at UVA, uh, the, the lab, um, the DH Lab at Vanderbilt that we were just at for the African American Intellectual History Society conference, these are all like physical spaces that can also um, that can visualize in the real world mm -hmm. the things that we really really like to see mm -hmm. when we're on um, social media, and that we should go for that as much mm -hmm. as we can. Thank you so much. Um, I want to capitalize kind of on something that a bunch of you have touched on, but maybe haven't expanded upon, and that's there are two missing voices on this wonderful panel, but that is those of us at small regional teaching institutions and community colleges. Mm -hmm. Those voices aren't represented on this panel here today, and, and only sparingly in this audience today. So I'm wondering how can we break down the boundaries between the large research institutions and kind of welcome those from um, the kinds of institutions that are really in the trenches in a lot of ways in, in these conversations, and how we can maybe bridge those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it, it occurred to me while we were here too about the region and how fortunate we are in the region to have a lot of small liberal arts colleges as well as a lot of HBCUs in our region that aren't um, mm -hmm. reflected in this space as well. Um, I can tell you what we've been trying to do at Maryland. Um, so we're fortunate to have um, the African American Digital Humanities program there that's well funded right now. And so what we've decided is while, we're, while we are well funded, um, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that that funding extends beyond the University of Maryland, who has institutional support for those of us who are doing digital work. Um, so we have instituted programming and training and scholars and seed grants that are extended to those in the region. We have folks that we are working with that are at smaller HBCUs in the area, that are at regional institutions that are not as funded and do not have access to DH centers and DH programming, and specifically for us, African American DH programming. Um, but that's, that's, it is a drop in the bucket, right? Um, but what we hope to do is to extend what we're doing there uh, in ways that is useful for those who do not have Mellon funding to do it, mm -hmm. right? And so what does it look like to craft an African American Digital Humanities program outside of an institution that has years of support to do it? How do you do that with the resources that you have? How do you do that by drawing on the strengths and talents and needs and, um, and, and possibilities of your graduate students and of junior faculty and of committed senior faculty? Like, How do you make those kinds of bridges and connections? Um, how 
do you develop uh, programming that centers for us, that centers blackness um, unapologetically in the work that we do and extends then into the digital? How do you do that in spaces where it does not seem possible to do it at the start of it? Um, so that is what we are attempting to do right now is to have that kind of a conversation um, and to have it with the right folks. And so I hope that we're starting to do that and I hope that we do a better job of it as we go forward. I know we're running short on time, uh, but I wanted to, that, that's a brilliant uh, way to sort of think about these set of questions. And I, I hope that we can build on your model for other people yeah. in the table here. I'd also, uh, Amanda uh, and I both came out of DH SoCal, which had a lot more uh, Cal State Community College Hispanic serving institutions as part of it. Um, it was also an effective network. It was a network that was about um, generosity, hospitality, sometimes mourning. Um, and uh, we knew each other often through video conferencing. Um, but uh, I think that that being, that, that part of that in, uh, inclusive environment is also infrastructural and it's about the infrastructures of hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd like to, so deans usually say hello <laughs> at the beginning of uh, a symposium and then they disappear. And I'd like to point out that our dean has been at almost every session here <laughs> and that she uh, and our, our, our other dean of libraries here uh, have done a lot to sort of support the hospitality piece and the feeding people piece and the getting together piece. Um, and so I might sort of say, maybe you wanna say something about DH SoCal or <laughs> I mean, I've been thinking about DH SoCal a lot in, in, as we're having this conversation and, and the ways that it was very much an affective network um, and a network of people who really cared about each other. Um, but that also sort of drew on California in a way. And I think the, the iconicity of like driving to LA is just a thing that you do in Southern California. And so it was a very legible sort of social activity that was embedded into the, the things um, you know, that we did and, and, you know, in my transition from the West Coast to the East Coast, it's been really disorienting trying to get to know like, well, where are the spots that people go, you know, in this region? Um, and I know some of this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of, I mean, yeah, Williamsburg is great, um, but it, it, I mean, it, <laughs> but it's also really deeply uncomfortable for a lot of people as well, like as a space to, to gather, right? Um, and, uh, you know, my partner and I have been struggling with that a lot too, just being like in the, a sort of like creepy colonial um, <laughs> environment. Um, so I don't know, like where, where do we go here? Um, and, and I noticed that some of this conversation has been about Virginia, right, as a state. Um, I know that a lot of my professional affective networks revolve around the DMV, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where we're all like really close and um, just happen to have Jessica and Alexis and like people who had, were my friends before, now we're all in the same place. So um, I think we need more of a commitment to growing those personal relationships as well as, as on the sort of like professional side. Um, having more food, having more yeah. parties, yeah. Um, more concerts, <laughs> oh you know, and, and, and yeah, and the ways that like that was sort of what, I mean, that's what our networks have been about. The, the morning piece that you bring up, I've been thinking about that, um, was particularly with the very first Femtech Net conference at UC San Diego, where we were morning mentors. Um, and it was my first experience, I was a graduate student at the time of seeing women specifically that I looked up to get on stage in a professional setting and like openly cry mm -hmm. about like things that had to do with our work, right? Mm -hmm. And it was such a powerful experience for me to see the vulnerability and to see that like we're not just um, our work mm -hmm. in a way that, um, you know, the this, this symposium has filled my heart in, in many, many ways and I'm sort of like hungry for us to do it again and be more kind of like raw and open to each other. Because it, it was also very much about a lot of new people meeting each other or new networks mm -hmm. coming together in a, in a particular way. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here and for 
your open exchange of your ideas, the ways in which I've been very impressed how throughout the conference um, various participants have come with prepared material and then changed it based on what's been said here. Um, that doesn't happen to the degree that it has here very often at academic settings. And I also want to thank you, you the regional group, because I think you're one of the reasons that Liz agreed to come here. Um, one of the factors that really impressed me about why Liz wanted to leave California to come to William & Mary really as our first digital humanist, named digital humanist, was because she explained that her community was here on the East Coast and she was three hours time difference away. So it's partly thanks to you that Liz is here. <laughs> so thank you. Can I really quickly just, I, I wanted to uh, say in terms of doing this again, because I, it, shameless plug, um, I don't care, is that <laughs> we are putting together a conference next year for African American Digital Humanities at the University of Maryland based in large part on the work that we've been trying to do and cultivate to present some of our learning, some of our fails, right, about like what we got right, what we got wrong, and to continue this conversation among like-minded folks who are doing things in the region nationally, internationally as well. So you know, you can follow us on Twitter, at UMD underscore at him. You can follow our hashtag at, uh, at ADHUM, A-A-D-H-U-M, and our conference is next year, October 18th through the 20th, and so I hope that you will mark your calendars and you will be receiving a save the date very soon, and I hope that it's something that we can continue to have a conversation in that space too, because it is important to be in physical space together. And we should have a listener. I was just we going to say, like, <laughs> well, we have one, and you're happy to, you know, if you want to DM me, you can get on our list. <laughs> but we should have a listener. Yes. I mean, it would be, like, mm -hmm. sometimes it starts that simple. I mean, I think of, like, the Philly DH mm -hmm. community that grew, I, I think, I could be wrong, I think out of a listserv, mm -hmm. but I know I was talking to Amanda about it. I didn't really, I forgot you guys were SoCal community. <laughs> like, this is, like, there are, this is possible. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a thing that we can do right now. Yeah, because, um, like, We are transforming the yeah. So, so I, I guess the yes. closing question might be is that we've talked a lot about we've talked a lot about the issue of building a critical mass. And a critical mass is critical in a lot of ways. Um, it's both important but also uh, reflects certain kinds of challenges and uncomfortable conversations. Um, and so one question I might, uh, I, I love the idea of us sort of finishing with the kind of feel good question, but I'd also like to ask <laughs> a kind of harder question. Um, and it's a question about what does it mean though that many digital humanity spaces are not like this one? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I might see Jessica or I might see Gabrielle. Um, and, you know, often when you go to a DH event, uh, there is no critical mass of scholars of color. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, John could have some thoughts, but maybe other people too. Well, in terms of the history of, uh, I think, what's being called here capital DH, um, it's unquestionably uh, white male. Um, and in our particular uh, community that uh, includes an association for computers and the humanities in the US and um, parallel organizations in Europe, they've been better historically at uh, gender representation in leadership, for example, um, than in uh, any other kind of diversity. And um, I think it's it's a wonderful thing to have uh, sort of grassroots um, energy uh, coming up and asserting that um, you are also part of the conversation and that, um, you know, I've had uh, students who have come through library science programs and, you know, made a big impact uh, in this community. It is more, you know, I, I will say it, it still seems that that 
uh, assertion of diversity is happening more on what I would see as the media studies wing of digital humanities, the, the critique of culture and of technology and culture uh, versus the, uh, the more um, sort of uh, tool-oriented uh, computational kinds of digital humanities. Um, but I don't think that that's a, a given. Uh, I don't think that's a necessary future. Um, and I see, I'm beginning to see more evidence of people asserting themselves on the computational side as well. Yeah. That can't be good. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. No pressure. But <laughs> for my little point. But um, Marissa, and, you know, and I'm not saying this at all. Like I'm saying it in response, but not in contradiction. And I know I've done this myself as well. I did it yesterday. But you know, I have been thinking a lot, and in general, about sort of, you know, capital D H, and thinking too about how to sort of reframe. This is for me but I want to say it out loud, um, how I can sort of reframe even how we talk about that conversation. Um, I mean, as someone who transacts on all sides of DH, I'm in media studies, I do the small, what can sort of small critical DH stuff, um, but I also do computational work and make stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are other people like me. Mm -hmm. And I go to even sort of the big DH conferences. And um, even as a woman of color, I'm not, actually always alone, right? And so there's also something about this sort of stinking. And also you could do, I mean, if we were to step way back from this and thinking about where the projects that seem that people most know about or that colleges and universities know about, where the projects that get cited, you know, we work on the grant side of things, where the projects that get cited by people coming for money for their own large DH projects. When you take that perspective, the sort of on the ground perspective, the sort of capital DH thing sort of dissipates a bit. And I wonder for myself sometimes, too, how, what are some of the ways I can be more careful about thinking about that sort of capital DH? Because in a way, what I'm talking about is a feeling of sort of hegemonic presence or resource grabbing by certain populations within academia, but doesn't even reflect the realities of the things that actually most people, most programs, most departments, most you know, institutions care about. Right, I mean, I'm thinking recently a sort of chronicle article, weirdly misquoted, and um, sort of article, sort of articulating like sort of what's this value of DH, and it's talking about sort of capital D, capital H, and I think the response that so many people had to that was really getting to the feeling that many of these projects are projects that most people don't even care about that much anymore, not that they're bad projects or anything else, but they're actually from a particular moment in digital humanities, it was actually quite a while ago, that aren't as even common anymore, but somehow seem to be carrying all the social weight of accounts as DH, um, and that becomes really problematic um, and really complex. The only analogy I can ever think of in thinking about some of this is about my own perspective as someone who comes out of black studies training but has an English degree and works in an English department, an institution that also has a black studies department, and the ways in which my colleagues in black studies versus me in English get deployed differently by other institutions in relation to what we're supposed to signify, even though technically we all do the same thing. Right, and that becomes almost a similar sort of institutional moment or analogy for sort of thinking about this. So that was a very long way. Thank you for letting me think out loud. But all I was trying to get at is that there's something we actually need to be also doing in our reframing of this to say more openly the things we're concerned about in relation to digital humanity sometimes, but to not give up the term because there's a way in which this moment of almost self subsuming ourselves under the larger rubric might be doing its own sort of semantic dan you know, danger that we don't really want to enter into. I have one thing, uh, just a pitch. I was just at this, uh, the Digital Library Federation meeting in Pittsburgh uh, earlier this week, and that is an organization that has decidedly centered social justice in its mm. work. Uh, uh, the last, all the keynotes, I think, in the last couple of years have been scholars of color. This year it was Rashida Phillips, who uh, uh, runs, uh, I was unfamiliar with her work, but it's Afrofuturist Affair uh, and does work around um, displaced communities in North Philadelphia, which is her community. Uh, so this is under the leadership of Bethany Novisky, and I think she has really centered this around uh, it being a, uh, a place that centers 
scholars of color and queer scholars uh, in the work that they do and, and, and provides. That is a forum for that, so I, I would uh, really recommend if anybody's interested in a, in a professional organization, a community that's not just librarians, but yeah. is mostly librarians, that uh, that's a really interesting conference. I've enjoyed the last couple of years, and it's doing amazing work. We also need to center just in the bare bones of our presence, yeah. even beyond what we represent or bring yeah. to any group. That well, I would even expand on that. So we've talked about how do we continue to increase the, the communication? How do we stay connected? Mm -hmm. And it's not, I, I, I would say, both uh, an organization like you're talking about, but also creating an environment where we can all come together, like an online resource where we can sit there and say, these are, these are the things that I am interested in. And this is what Jessica Marie Johnson is interested in. This is what Catherine is in interested in. So that when new scholars are coming in, they can now step in and say, okay, these are the people who are doing this type of work. I am interested in this, but this is my lane. Mm -hmm. So going back to the whole, I, I know what I do well. Here are these people that do that well. And creating an environment where we can all come in and step in and say, okay, how do I connect with that individual? Mm -hmm. So creating an online resource where Somebody can come in and find those people easily. But then we could also sit there and say, well, here are a number of, of DH organizations or a number of DH conferences or whatever that we can now step forward and make a presence at that we have not mm. made a, a, a more formal presence at before. Mm -hmm. um, and putting together panels to increase that conversation outside of our network, outside of the networks that are already doing this work, but really really bring it to light in, in the groups that aren't talking about it as much. Okay, sorry, because I'm gonna like, I'm gonna like pull us down um, because I, I love all of this, you know, we need to go in there as a block and sort of just like take over these spaces and I totally believe in this, but I also feel like there hasn't been enough um, conversation within DH more broadly and at this conference in particular about toxic dynamics within our, our spaces. Um, and this is what, yeah, Marissa got me all like hyped up to say something um, about, you know, individuals within the community who are responsible for certain behaviors, um, who have been invoked in this room, right, as, uh, as sort of like field builders who engage in sexual harassment, for example, um, and sort of thinking of Twitter as our platform that, I mean, we get trolled by scholars too, right? It's just not, not just the like scary public. I remember and transform DH like as really junior grad students, we got <laughs> we got called out, um, dragged by very high profile people, right? And these are um, I think it is about resource grabbing. I think there is a certain like toxicity to the way that DH is centered in a lot of money and is is sort of placed in this position as um, the future of the humanities by particular institutions. Um, that leads us to be really like, um, or leads the community to kind of uh, be, you know, sort of drunk with its own power in, in particular ways. Sorry. So can we say thank you?